Please stand in honor of the gospel. Jesus reminds us in today's gospel from Luke chapter 6 that no matter how difficult things get, we can consider ourselves blessed because great is our reward in heaven. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their fathers treated the prophets. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may take your seats for our next hymn. This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, fellow believers. Gooey fudge brownies was the winning phrase this past Monday night on Wheel of Fortune. And the lady, she did an incredible job to get that answer. And when she said it, she saw all the letters light up on stage and Vanna White go out and start tapping each one and turning them over, which matched her answer. And she heard Pat Sajak say, yes, that is the correct answer. And the tears flowed and the jumping up and down and the ecstatic nature. And her family and friends that were in the audience came rushing out and they began hugging each other. And then Pat Sajak took that, that card that she had selected from that, from that wheel 
And he opened it up to reveal the grand prize, 37 more thousand dollars that she had added to her already $25,000 total for a grand total of 62, now that's a lot to rejoice, $62,000. All of this going on, tears and exuberance. And then it cut to a commercial and went on to the next thing. Because that's how this world works. There's always something next. There's always something more. But for the Christian, there is no next thing after what we're talking about today. This is what it's all about. What 1 John talks about here in chapter 3, and he, and he spells out for the Christian, this is everything for which Jesus did all that he did. This is the goal of everything. To get you to this eternal life. There's, there's no commercial that comes after heaven for the next thing after. There's no bigger and better thing after the grand prize of eternal life. This is what it's all, it's not like for the Houston Astros where they can say like this last week, well at least we have next year. For the Christian, this is it. This is for eternal glory. This is for life with with God. This is for life with the angels. This is for life with all the saints who have gone before trusting Jesus Christ. This is what it's all about. And if you can try this morning and find another kind of earthly grand prize that can equal this or outmatch this, be my guest. If you can find even an earth, earthly prize that, that can come close to this, good luck. You're going to need it. Because it's impossible. Eternal bliss. And in 1 John chapter 3, John confidently tells you that that tremendous grand prize that only God can give, he's given it to you right now. It's yours. He says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Please don't all rush the stage at once. Thank you. Because that grand prize is completely yours. Children of God. And no, maybe that doesn't sound so exuberant. Maybe that doesn't sound so exciting because it's Pastor Miller, a fellow sinner, saying that to you about fellow sinners. It's just another human being saying that about you. But you need to look very carefully at what this says. John writes that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. It's not me saying this about you. It's not the Apostle John saying this about you. It's that we should be called by God himself children of God. It is God who calls you this. It is God's love that has done this for you. It's the gospel which we've come to hear again today that reaffirms and reassures us in this, that this truly is what God has done for us. He's made us children of God. You are God's children. Inheritors. Legal rightful inheritors of all that heaven itself holds. It is yours. God himself says so. And God's love has made it so. So incredible is the love of God that does this, that our NIV translation today that we have calls it lavish. It, it's a Greek word that just means he, he gives it. But it's just incredible. The kind of love that God has lavished on us is a kind of love that didn't make this a wheel of fortune puzzle that had to be solved by our own human intellect because we'd never be able to. We'd be standing there and we'd be droopy sad because we wouldn't get the grand prize. It's the kind of love that didn't make it dependent on our own finances and, and buying God off because we'd never have enough. It's a kind of love that wasn't dependent on our gifts and abilities to be able to make this happen. The lavish love of God solved the puzzle for all people. God did this himself in the scriptures. The Holy Spirit makes it clear who the answer is. It's Jesus Christ. 
And he makes that revelation clear and he spells that name out for all people to see in every language using whatever letters of their alphabet they need to spell that out. That's the answer. Jesus Christ is your ticket to eternal life. Jesus Christ is your righteousness that meets every requirement God put on you. He met for you. Jesus Christ is the answer because he gives all of the work of his life from his conception all the way to the crucifixion and burial and resurrection. He just, he just gives it completely for free to you. Now that's, that's certainly lavish love, but that's not just the extent of lavish love, that he freely does this with no string attached. What makes it even more lavish is that he does this for people like you and me across the world who just absolutely don't deserve one lick of this. You understand the kind of people we are, the kind of people that have walked our own way and gotten into our own gooey, gooey sins. And often we celebrate it. The kind of people that we are, the kind of people that love to lavish ourselves with our own love, and we love to do it to such a degree that it's so selfish and self-absorbed and, and wrapped up in, in ourselves that... To have a mind for the things of God? Absolutely not. I want my own things. And I'm going to pursue my own things. That's what we do. And yet God, not only to just sinful people who go their own way, to people who just don't deserve any of this, God lavished his love in Jesus Christ on, it, on us to such a degree, his love changes our hearts. His love changes our thinking. Even to the point where the reason we came to church today was to acknowledge our sins and to tell them just how torn up over them we are. Lord, here they are again, another week full of them. I'm sorry about them. And you came to hear God's lavish answer in Jesus Christ and to see this just incredible love that's so beyond anything we know on earth that God looks at us and says, Absolutely. I forgive all of those things. I forgive you. Jesus, my son, took care of all of it again. So that the father is yours and you are the father's. You belong to one another again. You are God's child. Lavished in love. Even if the world doesn't see it even if the world has no clue and can't tell what's truly remarkable about you, that right now heaven is yours, the grand prize of everything Jesus did and God accomplished in his son. It's your, the world has a hard time seeing that in you. Why? Well, because we age the same as everybody else in this world. Last week, we slipped on the snow and the ice the exact same as everybody else in this area. There was no difference between us. Your car and my car, they need new tires. They get... They break down and they go off the road. They need the same kind of tow truck all the other people in the world need. They, they need the same kind of mechanic and car shop our cars need. We go to the same hospitals. We go to the same restaurants. Outwardly, we look exactly the same. Our outward lives, in a manner of speaking, are just like theirs. They see no difference in us whatsoever. Why we should be able to have this tremendous hope of heaven. And John brings that out. He says... The reason the world does not know us and tell us apart is that it did not know him. There's no rush in their heart. There's no thrill of the gospel in their soul. There's no recognition of who you are and what you have because they don't know God like you do. They don't know Jesus Christ the way you do Oh, they have the same Bible. They can look at the same pages in their Bible if they bother. But they disregard it. And they deny it. And they set it aside. And they have the same opportunity to come to this 1030 church service just like you do. To hear the same lavish love of God that's applied to them. That tells them they are children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And, and they don't. They have all the same 
answers that you do. And they need the same answer you do. But their attitude in sin is so very, very different. And sadly, so will their outcome be so different from yours. They are not saints of God. They are not on the way to heaven. But John makes it very clear as children of God exactly where you are headed. He says, Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. You know, there's not one of us in here who hasn't struggled with what this life throws our way. There's not one of us in here who hasn't asked in a frustrated way those questions that the psalmists do. Why, Lord? Why do you let me struggle like this? Why do I struggle so? Why do you seem so distant from me? Why did you allow this to happen? Why did you take this person that I cared about from me? Why? And, and, and the list can go on and on. Why didn't you with your power intervene here? The day is coming where God is going to peel that veil away. That wondering why sense. And he's going to peel that away and you are going to stand there in heaven and you are going to see God face to face. That means on that day, God is going to hide nothing from you including himself. And as you stand there, John paints the picture that he says, I, in a human way, I have no idea what we're going to be like. Certainly we're going to be body and soul. Jesus is going to raise our bodies from the dead. We're going to be there bodily, body and soul. We're going to be glorified. We're going to be holy, just like Jesus. We're going to be sinless. We're not going to have this sinful nature anymore. We're going to be, in a manner of speaking, timeless because we're not going to die again. We're just going to keep living in eternal bliss. But he doesn't know exactly how it's going to be. But the one thing he says is you're going to understand. Not that you're going to be omniscient and know everything, but you're going to understand when you see God face to face. Well, what does that mean? Do you remember when you were a kid, if you're grown up now? Do you remember how you didn't understand your parents? How some days they just seem so mean. Why can you only have two cookies and not 20? Why, why do you only get one piece of cake and not the whole cake? Why did they let you go to your friend's house this day, but on another day when you really wanted to go, they didn't let you and you got so angry with them? And, and maybe you wanted to go to this party and they said no and... And they didn't always let you in on their will. They didn't always let you in on why they decided. What, and even if they did, it, you wouldn't have understood. And there was a tension sometimes between you and your parents. And then you grew up. And maybe the Lord blessed you with children. And that day came where you kind of scratched your head and you said, I think I get it now. I think I understand why they did what they did. That day's coming with God, where you're going to stand before God and you're going to see him face to face, and there you're going to understand. You're, you're not going to understand everything the way God does. He's omniscient, but you're going to understand why he did what he did. You're going, to, you're going to know why he allowed those things to happen to you, and in a way, in 1 John, he tells you now. God did all of these things out of love for you to be there. To stand there, to enjoy eternity with the Lord forever. God arranged all of these things, even though you didn't understand on earth as a child of God, there that day we grow up and, and we're glorified in God's presence and we see the wisdom of God's love behind it all, that this was for our eternal glory lavish love in Jesus Christ that solved the puzzle for us and made us his children. Lavish love in Jesus Christ that we trusted and held firm to even when it was hard that brought us to eternal life to see God face to face. That means something. 
And it means something for our daily, practical, earthly living right now. John summarizes it and says, Everyone who has this hope in Jesus purifies himself, just as Jesus is pure. Lutherans are not so heavenly minded that they're of no earthly good. We're not just talking about heaven in a nice flowery kind of way. That is yours. That is what God is going to give you for Jesus' sake. But now we apply it. And the way John applies it is he says, purify yourselves. What does that mean? Well, it really means keep yourselves pure in your decisions, in your choices, in the way you live. Stay in God's paths. Stay in his grace. Stay in the love Jesus has given to you and revealed to you because this is where the grand prize is, in God's love. Stay pure in that. Notice it doesn't say make yourselves pure because that would be an impossible puzzle none of us could solve. None of us could do, and therefore none of us would get eternal life. But when he says purify yourselves, keep yourselves pure on this path, that is something we can strive to do through faith in Jesus and stay in him. And so it has to do with all of our daily living. We want to live for the Lord. One commentator said in reading about this verse, he said, we want to be the best children for the Lord who loves us so tremendously. We want to be the best children we can be. That means I want to come to church next week. And as God gives me the opportunity every week, I want to be the best parent I can be. I want to be the best spouse I can be. I want to be the best pastor I can be with the gifts God has given me. I want to be the best five-year-old I can be. And listen to my parents. I want to be the best student I can be. Whatever we do in life, out of love for the Lord, we want to glorify God and live a pure and holy life to give glory to the one who's lavished his love on us. Isn't that why? God has lavished his love on us. Solved the puzzle. Made us children of God. That is what you are. God has lavished his love on us that he's shown you not necessarily exactly what you're going to look like, but he shows you exactly where you're going to stand. You're going to stand and be able to see God face to face, and you're going to love eternal life, which means we want to stand firm right now, and we want to put our spiritual sense into practice and live a pure and holy life, giving honor to Jesus Christ. All of this, all of this comes together in a miraculous, powerful way by the word of God to bring us to glory. This is for your eternal glory, the grand prize of it all. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please stand.